Hey, everybody, and welcome to Red May. We're into our second week now. Uh, uh, we just had a great event with Michael Heinrich early in the day. Uh, and uh, whoops, I guess my video is not started. So we'll, we'll do it again. Uh, anyway, uh, we're on our second week of our 30-day uh, vacation from capitalism. If you go to www.redmayseattle.com, uh, .org. You can see our full schedule. And uh, you can also uh, donate there, uh, uh, either through our uh, GoFundMe or as a Patreon. We uh, depend on the kindness of strangers, uh, a festival with the uh, slogan, take a vacation from capitalism is not something that can find any institutional funding, not in these United States. Uh, but I'm very excited uh, today uh, to bring an event uh, called A Red Deal with the Humble People of the Earth. Uh, it's uh, uh, celebrating a new book by the Red Nation, uh, which many, many of you know. Uh, Nick Estes is one of the co-founders, has uh, been events for Red May and is in one later this year. But uh, I'm happy to... Uh, invite another co-founder of the Red Nation, Melanie Yassi, who's a citizen of the Navajo Nation. Uh, she's assistant professor of Native American studies and American studies in New Mexico. And she's the president of the board of directors for Red Media. There's a great podcast that everybody should listen to. Uh, Melanie will introduce the panel and perhaps give a, some background on the new book that's out. Welcome to Red Bay, Melanie. Thanks, Philip, for that introduction. Yat uh, eh, everyone, yat eh, shikeh, I just greeted you as relatives, my relatives and my people. Um, it's really lovely to be here again. I'm Melanie Yazi, a uh, member of the Red Nation. Everyone who's gonna be speaking today is a member of the Red Nation, longtime members uh, doing incredible work. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit, I think about the book, how it came into existence as a project, um, kind of some of the major contributions or the types of things that we really wanted to advance um, and bring out into the world through the Red Deal. Uh, and also talk a little bit about the Red Nation if folks don't know too much. So the Red Nation was founded in the fall of 2014, um, coming off of a really vibrant anti-police brutality uh, movement and uprising in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and part of that uh, police, anti-police violence uprising um, was a conversation that was starting to happen between myself, um, Nick Estes, who is my partner and also a co-founder of the Red Nation, and a handful of other revolutionaries who were trying to organize around policing at the time. Um, we started to develop an analysis of the way that vigilantes, right, so sometimes off-duty cops, sometimes um, uh, corrections officers who are off duty, who are armed and kind of patrol and troll the streets of reservation border towns, which Albuquerque is, it's completely surrounded by indigenous land, um, go out and do something that is called Indian rolling. And Indian rolling is historically um, mostly white and Hispano males, really from teenage all the way up into old age, going out and basically sport killing our relatives, um, specifically Navajo people in the border towns that kind of I grew up in around the Navajo nation. Um, and so that summer, just a few weeks, few months after the uprising started, uh, two Navajo relatives, uh, Key, Key Thompson and Allison Gorman were brutally murdered by four of these teenagers, these teenage vigilantes in an act of Indian rolling on Albuquerque's west side. And so part of what we wanted to start the Red Nation to address was the fact that there was very little conversation at any level, at any scale about the kind of violence that happens against urban and border town native populations. And we wanted to make a connection, right, between policing like the dudes and the badges, right? And the dudes on the streets, Indian rolling and killing our people. And that the kind of terrorization of our people, particularly unsheltered native people of which there's a very high percentage in border towns um, that that, violence was part of this larger structure, right? This larger structure of settler colonialism that seeks to erase our people, that seeks to disappear our people, um, you know, and the part, the larger project to kind of take native land, um, to liquidate native land, to, to 
terminate indigenous sovereignty. So the project of US empire can be complete once and for all. It cannot be complete so long as native nations and native people still exist. Um, so this is how the Red Nation started. Uh, there was also vibrant work going on around Palestine and the liberation of Palestine and that solidarity work here in the United States. And of course, 2015 and 2016, all the way up until you know 2020, we saw incredible uprisings all over North America against resource extraction coming from indigenous front lines. And so the Red Nation has always done work and we all have always seen these issues interrelated, um, whether it's resource extraction, police violence, you know, urban native uh, issues, um, homelessness and those types of things. Uh, and so the Red Deal was something we started to have a conversation about in early 2019. Um, of course, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had just released right uh, her version of the Green New Deal not too, too long before that. And we decided to read the Green New Deal. Um, we were aware that the Indigenous Environmental Network, which is also another important um, indigenous organization that has been around um, throughout the 21st century, had a critique right, of the Green New Deal, that it wasn't strident enough on resource extraction. Um, of course, what we've seen for several decades coming out of indigenous front lines, um, environmental and climate justice front lines is the demand to keep it in the ground, right? Meaning keeping fossil fuels, keeping resources in the ground. Um, because of course we know that the extraction of those resources is one of the primary causes of poverty as well as just violence, social violence, environmental violence that native people continue to experience at higher rates than almost anybody, right, in North America. And so we read the Green New Deal and we wanted to build off of IEN, the Indigenous Environmental Network's um, critiques. And we decided that there were some things that the Green New Deal did not address well enough, right? So indigenous people are mentioned twice in the Green New Deal uh, in relationship to environmental racism. So the disproportionate impact, right, of um, capitalist development schemes, i.e. resource extractions on indigenous communities. And then the upholding of treaty rights is mentioned in passing, I think in a list of other other types of um, other types of things that need to be addressed through the Green New Deal. And so we thought, well, actually like treaty rights are really central, um, but also so too is decolonization and land back and anti-imperialism, right? And having a much stronger stance on capitalism. And so we just hatched this plan. There was a group of about a dozen of us in the Red Nation, all native people. And we're like, we should just indigenize the Green New Deal and we should just go much harder, right? About capitalism and US imperialism. And so something that of course was also happening in 2014, 2015 was the emergence of what became Black Lives Matter, right? And the movement for black lives. And we of course grew up with Black Lives Matter. We've existed pretty much along the same kind of timeline as Black Lives Matter. And so the conversation, right? About the abolition of police um, about defunding the police has been in, incredibly influential, as well as the longstanding calls for abolition out of the Black liberation struggle. And so something we wanted to do in the Red Deal is respond to that call and incorporate it really centrally into this indigenous vision we had for decolonization and liberation um, that was specifically about addressing climate justice and climate change um, and stopping climate change so that we don't go extinct, right, as a species and as a planet. So. The main sort of argument of the Red Deal is that we want to, it's an abolitionist argument, that we want to defund and take resources away from the institutions that cause the greatest harm in our society, carceral institutions. The US military, right, is the greatest purveyor of violence on the earth. It's the number one enemy to liberation and revolutionary struggles in the global north and in the global south, certainly for indigenous sovereignty and liberation here in the belly of the beast. And so the US military is a carceral institution, right? The police. And so what if we took resources away from those institutions of harm and we simply reinvested those resources into the common dignity of all? And this is also what longstanding socialists have also argued, right? Using the mechanisms of the state to redistribute resources. It's not that there is a scarcity of resources available, Right, it's that the ruling class hoards those resources, the 1% hoards those resources at the peril of billions of people, right? The working class and the lumpen proletariat, for example, and indigenous people. And so what if we reinvested all of that wealth that's hoarded for all of the harm and the violence that's done, and we put it into housing, we put it into transportation, we put it into food, we put it into ending missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and two spirit. What if we put it into promoting tribal sovereignty? What if we put it, you know, 
into to food sovereignty projects, um, all of these different areas. And so the Red Deal is broken up kind of into these different areas. The first one kind of sets up the, the problem, like these are the, ins the carceral institutions that we want to abolish. And the abolition would mean that we would take resources away from that. And then parts two and three of the book are the areas of the areas of struggle that we have identified as the places of greatest need, right? The greatest need for poor and working class people, especially communities of color in the global South to be able to simply survive so that we can build the kinds of vibrant revolutionary movements that we need, you know, in order for liberation from capitalism, which is the ultimate goal that we articulate in the Red Deal um, to happen. And so something else that we do in the Red Deal, we take indigenous knowledge very seriously. So we, what we often find um, in progressive and left spaces or pretty much just mainstream spaces, um, you know, are that indigenous people, um, I've said this before, often kind of like the cultural window dressing, you know, for certain movements um, that are spiritual and ceremonial traditions and our forms of knowledge are often treated as kind of like the, the, the feathers and the drums, you know, that you bring to an action. Um, and for us, of course, our knowledge predates the existence of the United States. It's still here through our languages and our practices of caretaking the land, which we talk a lot about in the Red Deal. And so for us, indigenous knowledge isn't so much about those things because you know those aren't things that everybody should be able to practice. Like those are things that can need to be kept safe in our communities, but our science and our technology, right? Like caretaking the earth requires really in-depth, sophisticated knowledge of agriculture, of, of water, of botany, of soil conservation, of how to build infrastructure, right? To live in harmony with the earth. And so in part three of the Red Deal, which is called Heal the Earth, Heal the Planet, we talk a lot about how could we employ indigenous science and technology as a method towards healing the earth from right the ravages of cap that capitalism um, has created and has perpetrated right against Mother Earth. And so we really advance a not an argument for indigenous knowledge and taking indigenous knowledge seriously um, in this program. And so in many ways, you know, the Red Deal is, takes the Green New Deal as its starting point. It's not really a rebuttal of the Green New Deal, but it takes that as its starting point. It indigenizes it, it expands it significantly and provides a much more comprehensive program for and a very indigenous centered program, right? For how we need to be addressing climate justice and climate change, where indigenous people are not on the margins as we often are, but we are at the center of that struggle, not because we're just making an argument to be centered, but because we factually empirically are at the center. Indigenous movements, frontline movements against resource extraction have hands down been the most militant transformative arm of the climate justice struggle since it began. And so for us, and those movements have been led primarily by indigenous women, youth and LGBTQ2 relatives. And so we need to be listening to those individuals and taking leadership from those people and those communities when we're doing anything addressing climate justice. I mean, like, I know everyone's all down with Greta, but like Greta came across, you know, the Atlantic Ocean in a ship the same way the pilgrims did, <laughs> the Mayflower. You know, we don't need European solutions to climate justice on stolen land, right? We need indigenous solutions to climate justice um, and to climate change on stolen land. And as we argue repeatedly in the Red Deal, you know, what confronts us, we just we wanna be very honest, what confronts us is decolonization or extinction. And there's no program there's no program for climate justice, for you know, ending carbon emissions, carbon caps, carbon markets, green capitalism that would allow land in the so-called United States to remain in the hands of settler capitalists and settler property owners and the settler ruling class that would ever facilitate the kind of transformative change at the urgent rate at which we need it to save the planet and to save our species. But indigenous people have been fighting this, this battle against the United States, the greatest empire that has ever existed, right? The greatest capitalist empire, the most violent, powerful empire that has ever existed. We've been fighting this battle for 500 years. We know what we're doing. And the Red Deal takes that history seriously and that knowledge seriously. And so we want you to take us seriously 
because you can trust us because we've been doing this for a long time and we have been very successful in many ways in our movements. Um, one last thing that I wanted to say before I hand it over to Demetrius, you can talk first if that's okay, uh, is that, you know, we also, we find that in indigenous movements, right? So we're also, we're trying to address mainstream climate justice and environmental justice movements. We're trying to speak to leftists, non-native leftists in the United States, but we're also trying to be accountable, you know, for the fact that we, as citizens of the United States, unwilling in some ways, especially as native people under colonial occupation, that we are responsible for trying to stop US imperialism, the US war machine, the sanctions that hold one third of the earth's population hostage that kill tens of thousands of people in the global south every year. And so something we wanted to do was we wanted to draw from the Cochabamba agreement of 2011. You will see this a lot in the Red Deal. We talk a lot about it because in that agreement, it was a gathering of about 30,000 indigenous people from South America, particularly Bolivia, who came together and were like, we cannot have an indigenous platform for climate justice without addressing global capitalism and providing justices and redress for the violence that the US exerts through global capitalism on the rest of the world, but also the US military industrial complex, i.e. US imperialism through sanctions, war machines, the CIA, right? And so you have to address both US imperialism and capitalism if you have any hope of creating a successful climate justice, climate justice platform from a left indigenous perspective. It's not just about culture. It's not just about hugging trees, right? It's about being very serious about dismantling these structures that cause the greatest oppression and violence against our people. And so this is what we do in the Red Deal. This is the case we make. We draw, like I just described, from lots of different political traditions um, and histories of resistance to, to make these arguments. And so that's a little bit of a background on the book. Um, Red Media started in 2020 um, as an indigenous uh, media project that's accountable, that comes out of and is accountable to movements. And you know the press that Common Notions that we have our imprint with approached us and said, why don't you turn the Red Deal, which was really just like a pamphlet, you know, it was really just like a people's program. They were like, why don't you turn it into a book? And so last year in that long hot summer of Black Lives Matter uprisings, we were literally facing off with the fash in the evening and in the morning we were writing the Red Deal, right? And so this is what we were doing last year. And so that's what the Red Deal is. That's kind of the history of it. Um, the book was written quite literally by 20 different people. The words, the words you read in this book are the words of 20 different people, right? It's not just me, it's not just Nick Estes, who's like this famous Red Nation member, but like the Red Nation is a huge organization. Um, we're not just reduced to individuals. I mean, we're socialists we and indigenous. We believe in collectives, first of all. And so what you're seeing in the Red Deal is truly a collaborative project that comes from the ground up from, you know, a, a militantly left indigenous perspective written out of deep love for our people, deep love for all oppressed people and deep love and a commitment to ensuring that we have a future on this earth. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Demetrius, to provide some comments. We're just gonna go alphabetically through um, and then we'll do some Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mill. Demetrius Johnson, Dr. Jene. Yeah, so I'm I'm Dene. I live here in um in Tiwa territory, which is also known as Albuquerque. And just to give you guys some, I guess like background on the Red Deal and also just myself um, and my involvement within the Red Nation. Um, I became involved in the Red Nation back in 2015. I was doing my undergraduate at the University of Mexico studying electrical engineering. And the reason why I wanted to study electrical, electrical engineering is because the Navajo Nation has this huge energy problem. Um, you know, we have over 15,000 homes that are either unelectrified or they don't have running water. And coming from a, a nation and having like an understanding that we, we, we have one of like the largest um, coal powered um, 
energy stations within the Southwest that powers cities like Albuquerque, Phoenix, Tucson, Las Vegas, and parts of California. But understanding that even like places like where I'm from in Ganado, my, my grandma's home, some of my bishes, they don't have electricity. Um, I thought that, you know, studying electrical engineering would, would help me understand like, you know, and, and gather solutions to, to electrify my nation. However, like understanding, like it's not just like, it's not just gonna be like engineers that are gonna lead this movement. It's not just gonna be like, oh, like we just need like more science. We just need more technology to figure out all these solutions. It's actually a political problem. It's actually, you know, it, it's, it's actually colonization. It's actually capitalism that's, that's preventing my people from, from living a dignified life. But it's not just my nation. It's not just my, it's not just the Navajo nation, but it's other indigenous nations across Turtle Island and also in the global South that are facing the same problems. And the, the problem where this all stems from is from imperialism, is from like US capitalism, it is from US greed. And so the Red Nation helped me understand and develop my political thinking. Um, shout out to all those strong indigenous women that had to like drill that into me. Um, but that's also like where the Red Deal came from. Um, a lot of like, a lot of understanding. And, and make no mistake, when the Green New Deal came out and like, there's like, there was like this talk of, you know, sustainable energy, like green jobs, I was excited. Um, I thought this could be like an actual solution. However, like, again, understanding that indigenous people were being left out of these Green New Deal talks, but also understanding that how are we gonna get these resources? How are we gonna like create these solar panels? Like they're talking about electric vehicles now, like the resources and materials that those things need to happen to, to be created they also come from indigenous lands and indigenous peoples and sacred sites. So if we're going to move forward into like a green new economy, you're still like putting indigenous people in the afterburners. You're still, you're still building that, that, that economy upon indigenous bodies. And so the Red Deal addresses this. And that's why you need to like listen to, to indigenous people because this is actually our problem. And we are actually going to also be like the solution to this. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Mel um, and everyone. I actually have an emergency right now. I'm getting I'm getting some calls. Hold on. I'm sorry. Um, can we switch to Elena real quick? Sure, D. Sure. Thanks for those comments, um, Elena. And hopefully, we can come back to Demetrius. Uvi agindi totse na o te wa kawe kweri o mu herake to to wa un mu. Um, my name is Elaine Ortiz, and I am coming from Ogapoge, otherwise known as Santa Fe, New Mexico. I am a citizen of Okeawinge, and a very proud member of Red Nation. I want to talk about one of the basic tenets of the book, and sort of build on what. Um, Melanie was talking about what creates crisis cannot solve it. And when Melanie mentioned Greta Thunberg coming across on a boat like the Pilgrims, it made me laugh because the real genesis of climate change was caused by people coming over to Turtle Island and um, what are known as the Americas on boats. In 1491, the population of the so-called Americas was estimated about 100 million people. Our ancestors, our relatives, both um, across um, so-called North America and South America, many of our communities, many of our nations were farmers. And unlike what you see portrayed in Hollywood, um, Westerns or um, in cute little TV shows, um, we had huge communities. We had large cities. We had huge farming projects. And in what is now known as Mexico, Teotihuacan at its height was the sixth largest city in the world, a population of over 200,000 people. Most of those people 
were farmers and they farmed subsistence agriculture. They developed techniques of agriculture to feed the people. Corn came from a valley in central Mexico. It went south, it went north. It, it f is what fed our ancestors in the Southwest. Um, worldwide today, more than half the crops grown were first cultivated here in the Americas. So unlike what Rick Santorum may think, um, there is a hell of a lot of Native American in so-called American culture. Every tomato that's used in your spaghetti sauce, every potato that you use in your fourth of the lie potato salad came from this continent, from the so-called Americas. And every hot pepper in your Thai food came from these continents from North and South America. Um, when Europeans invaded the so-called New World, the Americas, they brought with them domesticated animals, domesticated livestock, which brought with them disease. So in 1491, the population of the, of the Americas was estimated, estimated at 100 million. By 1610, it had dropped by 90%, so 10 million people. With the deaths of 90 million people estimated um, in the Americas came the cessation of these massive uh, farming projects. And with the cessation of the massive farming pro um, projects came um, a drop in CO2, a massive drop in CO2, which signals to many scientists today the very beginnings of what's called anthropogenic climate change. So in other words, genocide, the genocide of indigenous people in the Americas is what really started climate change. So our, our ancestors and our relatives in the global South who were killed as a result of European invasion of settler colonialism, it was their deaths that caused, that started the first um, climate change and started um, what they call anthropogenic uh, climate change. So genocide will be recognized as a precursor to climate change. And 1610, as the year that it started, there is actually a, a proposal that is um, it right now in front of the global stratotype section and point um, and or the Global Standards Stratigraphic Act um, that is up for recognition that this golden spike in, in carbon dioxide um, is what started climate change in the Western hemisphere. So the idea that genocide, that the genocide of our ancestors is what's actually triggered um, the beginning of climate change and that it has been going on since 1492 uh, is is all the more reason why indigenous people have to be leaders in the mitigation of climate change. And we talk about this in the book that we may be, indigenous people may be 3% of the population, but we caretake 20 to 25% of the world's biodiversity. And in areas where indigenous communities caretake the, the um, forests, um, including the Amazon and um, many other uh, areas in Africa and Asia where, where indigenous people caretake the land, we have the greatest number uh, or the greatest amount of biodiversity. And without biodiversity, things like water purification cannot happen. So what is our history, which is this genesis of genocide and climate change? Um, comes the knowledge of how to caretake the land and how to mitigate min many of these disasters that are happening right now. And it's really important that we listen to indigenous communities, that we listen to indigenous people, and that we understand that, as, as Dr. Mal said, that we have been at the center of these fights since 1492, and we know how to lead these fights and we know what needs to be done. What creates crisis cannot solve it. Capitalism, colonialism, imperialism, 
if we don't rid ourselves of those structures, of those systems, we cannot save the earth. And if we cannot save the earth, there, there really is just that one barrel that we're staring down, which is extinction. Those are the truths. What is the answer? The answer is really very, very simple. And it's, it's really just two words. And I hope that these two words resonate and um, echo forever and ever and ever in people's minds because it's decolonization or extinction. And one of the ways that we can facilitate decolonization, land back, just say it, land back. Land back. Land back. And if Demetrius wants to continue, are you able to continue, D? Yeah, I'm able to continue. Sorry about that, y'all. But I hope like Elena didn't like say anything I'm about to say. <laughs> but um, yeah, like indigenous people are going to be the key to to saving this world, and like that's exactly like what the what the Red Deal talks about. Um, it's also like not like I said like we were ex I was I personally was excited when the Green New Deal did um, release, and, but even reading it, it's like only like what like two or three pages worth of just like actual just like what it's actually going to talk about. Um, and obviously, like that's 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 not enough. Um, but I think I, I agree with Elena. Land back is exactly like what we're talking about within the Red Deal. I mean, it's it's kind of like a, I mean, it's kind of like a book. But everything that we are talking about is 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 land back. Um, I don't have actually too much more to add besides that. But um, you know, we can pass it off to Orion. I might speak more when it comes to like Q and A time. Go for it, Orion. Alrighty. Hi, everybody. My name is Orion Longknife. I organize with the Red Nation. I'm also based in Ogapoke, White Shell Water Place. It's called Santa Fe now. I'm from San Carlos, Arizona, and um, Fort Bonnet, Montana. I'm Chiricahua Apache from San Carlos. I'm Chippewa Cree. I'm White Clay from Montana. Um, and you know, um, I feel like I'm just going to give a short introduction because there was a lot of good knowledge that was shared. There was a lot of good, like, the basics of Red Nation, the basics of the Red Deal. And I just like, I just want to add, like, you know, this whole process of us deciding that, you know what, we're going to do something, we're going to form an organization, and we're going to continue on from decades, not even decades, hundreds of years of resistance and revolutionary work. And I think that one of the most important aspects of what we do is like our the sharpening of our politics for our peoples in order we in order for us to be able to go to our communities and have them understand like these like these monsters we're facing in this reality, like you know, they're a continuation of what our peoples first faced, but now they have different names. Now they operate differently. And now the way that they move means that we have to move differently. And whether it's us like taking to the streets, whether that's us advocating for each other, whether that's us like demanding land back, whether that's us forming organizations or joining organizations, I think that one of the ways that like my time in Red Nation has made me understand is that like caretaking is gonna be one of like our, our most concrete ways that we can understand each other again and that we can understand like these systems again. And I think that's something that like, I'd really like just to add and emphasize is this notion of caretaking for us doesn't just mean like, we're gonna like, you know, put like some food out for like a cat on the street, which we will do. But it means like going out to our gardens. It means helping our relatives and our comrades understand a piece of literature more. It means us like deciding to wake up at five in the morning to catch a bus so we can support our families. It means us understanding that what we have to do in order to care for each other and ourselves 
means that we also have to understand that the destruction of like capitalism, U.S. imperialism, militarization, hyper-policing, the brutality of like black, brown, queer, disabled, and poor folks, it needs to be toppled down and it needs to be finished. And I think that what we're about to discuss later on concerning the Red Deal as a book and as like our process of like us articulating this, it's it's a defining moment, I think, for Red Nation. And it's something that I think we should all really be proud of. But that's all I have to add for now. Thank you. Aw, it is a defining moment for the Red Nation. Um, we really, we truly put two years of work into this book. And something I didn't talk about, we held community meetings in Albuquerque and Farmington out on the land with our people. You know, the, the 20 people, you see the words of 20 people in this book, but really it was hundreds of people actually who contributed to this. And, um, you know, as Dee said, like the Green New Deal is like two, three pages. Um, the Red Deal is 100 and <laughs> 150 pages, the 150 pages. And, you know, we started our own indigenous media platform to publish books like The Red Deal, you know, to do more podcasting, to provide this kind of perspective and this knowledge, um, you know, to our people, but also to the broader left, right? Because sometimes it, I think folks have good intentions, but they're very uninformed, I would say, about indigenous perspectives and that yes, there are indigenous leftists <laughs> first of all, right? And that we do study and we have a lot to say about these things that don't just affect us as indigenous people, but as you know, all of my comrades have stated will affect the entire planet, affect all of the species on earth because we're talking about climate change, you know? And something that I forgot to mention when I was doing the intro of the book is that something that we felt was so important, right? This decolonization or extinction kind of framework. It's not even a framework, it's just a reality that we have in our hearts and in our heads in the Red Nation and we operate from that. We operate from that because we know that that's what we're facing and what we must do, you know, to confront that reality that in the Red Deal, right? Like I think often, again, indigenous people kind of get marginalized or we get put into a certain kind of category, like an identity category. And then all of the different identities make up like the diversity of the movement. But what we're actually arguing in a way is a universalization of indigenous knowledge and indigenous politics, right? Not just at the scale of our own communities, although that is very important, but at a global scale, because what will it require, right? To end global capitalism, which is the greatest cause of, as Elena said, anthropogenic climate change. What will that require? That's going to require mass movements at a scale that I think many of us have never seen, especially those of us in the global North who have to live in the goddamn United States where like movements are so, so much smaller and so much more difficult you know, to really get going. And so something else, because we understand the scale at which we need to apply indigenous knowledge, at which we need to enforce indigenous you know, laws and customs of caretaking and being in right relation with the land. We argue that the only way, the only way we're gonna be alive you know, in 30 years is if we build mass movements, period. And that those mass movements must be anti-capitalist and they must be anti-imperialist, right? They must also be anti-colonial, of course. And so, one of the pillars, you know, Elena described, we have these pillars kind of like, here's the strategy that we're trying to propose in the Red Deal, right? What creates crisis cannot solve it, right? The ruling class, capitalism, what is it? Is it um, Ruthie Gilmore or Naomi Klein is like, it's like capitalism causing capitalism that then resolves capitalism. Like capitalism isn't gonna resolve itself, okay? Right, we all know this. The ruling class doesn't, doesn't want capitalism to end because that's the greatest source of their wealth and their power. And so we can't look to even ruling class politicians to create this change. We must look at our people, we must look at ourselves. And so we advocate for people power, right? A people power led mass movement because politicians will never be able to do what only mass movements can do. And those mass movements must be diverse, but they also must be at a scale 
that matches the, the, the threat the threat to our planet that we are actually facing. And so we talk about change from below and to the left, the, the notion of people power, why people power is so important and that politicians can't do what mass movements do. And for me, this is like a very important point because what we often see in progressive and left organizing in the so-called United States is an appeal to power. Indigenous people do it plenty of times too, where it's like, well, if we can get representation in Congress, you know, if we can get the Green New Deal, you know, passed in Congress, for example, with these ruling class politicians, then that will be the measure of our success, right, at advancing change. And for us, we've had incredible success as the Red Nation at smaller levels, like municipal, tribal, and state levels, of organizing a movement so strong that politicians and ruling class corporate elites cannot ignore us, right? So it's different. You're not trying to get policy change by appealing to halls of power. You are organizing people power and politicians must respond to you because you, are, you, have, you have built enough power that they cannot go on according to the status quo without making concessions, without meeting you, right? Without kind of coming to that table with you. And so we have had success building movements at a smaller scale. And we believe that we could have success in these same ways and make much greater gains at a larger scale. And so this is something we argue in the Red Deal. And one last thing um, before I would, maybe we can bounce some ideas off of each other here um, during the Q and A and the conversation, but we talk about the last pillar is from theory to action. Um, I'm an academic, right? I'm a professor. so. I'm all, I've, I was trained in theory, I have a background in feminist and queer theory, indigenous critical theory, theories of settler colonialism, Marxist, you know, theories of capitalism. And so theory is a very important tool. But when you're talking about the role of theory in movements, that theory actually comes from the work itself, the theory comes from struggle. And the theory must always apply to struggle to help advance and to nourish the struggle for liberation. And so for us, I, I do believe we, we offer some really beautiful, vibrant, sophisticated indigenous theories of capitalism, of liberation, of decolonization, of imperialism, of caretaking in this book. But for us, the theory doesn't matter unless it's embedded in action. The Red Nation has always been a very action oriented organization. We wanna go out amongst our people. We wanna be on the streets. We wanna be feeding our people. You know, we want to be out building the movement, like physically building the movement, building institutions like red media, media power, right? We believe in building indigenous power from the bottom up. And so we are not interested, right, in the intellectualizing or even ideological battles over how we're supposed to address climate change. We are interested in ideas that lead to action, but that come out of action because we know that these have been tried and tested and tried and true, and that there are things we can continue to implement. But the goal always in the Red Nation and the Red Deal is action. It's about advancing the struggle for liberation. Because if we don't, like we're just not gonna have a future. And this is something Native women, Red Nation is a Native women, um, femme and LGBTQ led organization and something that we always, I think about all the time is the native women, like the elders of the movement, those who have come before me and become before the Red Nation, you know, they're, they're, they've always, you know, drilled into us, like your life doesn't belong to you. My life here in this moment doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the future, right? And that's a native indigenous feminist and a militantly left indigenous perspective. So what are we going to do here today to ensure that our people, our species, life on earth has a future. And so this is the truth. This is the truth that we are expressing in the Red Deal. And it is simply the reality um, that everyone must confront, not just indigenous people. Um, so I just wanted to add those things to the conversation. Um, uh, so anyone wanna add anything else on? We can try to have a, go for it, Elena. Thanks for that, um, Dr. Mel. And and so we do come from a long line of revolutionaries and revolutionary grandmothers and revolutionary women who have um, been fighting since 1492 
to ensure the survival of our people and the survival of all of our relatives and the 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 four-legged and the winged relatives and the and the relatives who live below the earth and the relatives who fly among us and they have depended on us to take on the responsibility to caretake the earth and it isn't something that we can stop that we can say no to and it's not something that that we can ignore so this is our mandate this is our responsibility and as melanie said our lives don't belong to us they belong to the next seven generations because if we don't do something now there won't be an earth left for the next generation or even the generation after that and this isn't a book that you can give to your kids and say this is something you need to start learning about because by the time they're ready to enact what is is set forth in that book it's going to be too late this is a book about what needs to be done now and right now this is this is a book about um saving a world that's on fire and we need to start addressing that right now the the time is rapidly running out we were facing a 30 year deadline it's like the the egg timer's been turned and we're watching the sand drop through but it's not dropping through run one grain at a time it's moving really really fast and it's time for us to to face that and to stop pretending that someone else is going to take care of this because it is up to us and it's up to the indigenous leaders to set forth the path that we have to take in order to stop this but it's up to everyone else to listen and to to acknowledge that this great imperial project of the last almost 300 years is failing, has failed. It failed before it started by being built on stolen land by people who were stolen from their land. So this failed project needs to be swept away. And what needs to be built are communities based on caretaking and on um, deep love and reverence for the land and for all of the relatives with whom we share the land. And that's all I want to say. Thanks, Elena. So kind of building off of what you just said, uh, it'd be great if you all could respond in turn. Um, I was thinking, trying to formulate a question while you were talking about you know, like this isn't a book you can just hand to your kid and be like, you need to start learning. And so in about 20 years, <laughs> when you can join the movement, you know, then you can like put it into practice. Um, like that just, that can't fly, right? That can't fly because of this ticking clock. The egg timer is on, right? And so I taught this book, I, I taught a graduate seminar this past semester. Um, it's just wrapping up on Tuesday about the politics of care. And we read the Red Deal. Actually, it was really amazing to hear feedback from my students, all graduate students. And I have my graduate students say that, you know, it was interesting because there is this idea, I think, that movements are led by youth or that there's like the fire and the passion is more intense with young people. And so like the next generation of young people will save us was kind of this like mentality. And I think it's this mentality that's built into movements and I was thinking about the Red Deal and who the Red Deal is for, right? It's written by a multi-generational group of indigenous people, but also who is it for, right? Who is our audience? Like who are we writing this for? And what do we want them to do with the book? It's, it can't just be like, oh, so like the next half generation or like even the Zoomers, right? The Zoomers will save us. Like those of us who are older can you know, we can hand off the torch of the movement to them. I, I mean, we can't, 
like that just can't happen, right? It needs to be intergenerational and it needs to be in the here and the now. It can't be some sort of deferred future when like this stuff is all supposed to happen and to culminate. And so this being kind of the, the thrust of decolonization or extinction and like the reason we wrote this book for all three of you, who do you see? Who is this book for? And what do you want them to do with what we say in this book? Because it's a book, but it's really a political program for militant revolutionary action, right? So I'm gonna pose that to you three. I can, um, I can start. So when this book was actually being written, there was, I don't know what it was. There was like a whole like, I don't know, I think everyone was just talking about like the world being on fire and people were just like throwing out their crazy ideas. But one thing I saw like gain a lot of momentum um, and I don't know like if it was due to like pop culture at the time or maybe like it was just only specific here to like the United States. But like one of the one of the things I saw to like curbing like climate change was literally just like, well, if we just like do like population control and just like re start reducing the population, like then we'll have like enough resources to go around. But interestingly enough too, that was around the same time, like, I don't know, like if, if any of you've like seen like Marvel movies or like Avengers, um, it's like the same ideology like that Thanos has, like he snaps his fingers and like half of like the universe just like disappears. And like that way we'll have like enough resources to go around. And when I think of that, like, and like about the time, like this was being written, like, it's just, it's just very like coincid, like, I don't know, that like, coincidental, but also it's just like, I don't know, it's just funny because like this book actually counteracts like all those ideas. Like, of course, there's like enough resources to go around. Of course, like, there is like enough like earth for all of us. But the thing like that's, that's not like the uh, like the lack of resources is like not the problem here it's like how these resources are being used and like who's controlling a lot of these resources and it's like not from the people that that produce it or like from the people that that actually where like these resources come from from the land um it's like it's, it's the rich and wealthy and even now like it was just like what like i think a month ago or a few weeks ago um nick estes wrote this article about bill gates like owning are like buying like more farmland and like how like he has he Bill Gates actually owns more land than his own tribe. And so like all these resources, all these, I know, all, all this land, all this power is actually going to the elite. And so when this this book is literally just saying, like, yo, just listen to indigenous people, like we don't own the land. Like I think there's also like this misconception that indigenous people own the land and like we just want to like swap the power of just like hey like now we're on top like that's not that's like not that's like that's not what it is like we don't we don't believe we own the land like we're just saying like yo just take care of the land so that my great 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 grandchildren can just like live a live a dignified happy life and like the world's not on fire like that's all we're saying like but i i like the red deal i just believe is just to it's for the the people here and now to actually just like hey like if you if you if you if you don't want the world to exist anymore like you know what you better just start caring because like it, it, this this is this is literally the playbook this is the game plan of how we are going to we are going to we are going to save this world and if if you're not down with it then then you just suck but that's all i got to say uh, <laughs> nice ending d nice ending uh, Orion and Elena, who is this book for and, and what, what do you want them to do with it? I can go. I think that this book's for anybody and everybody. I think that this book is for like my people, my family. I sent my family copies and I was like, hey, look, I did this. <laughs> um, I think that this book is for folks that like, I think this book is for the folks that they they care for life and they care about what they see happening around them, but they don't know what the pushing point is for them. I think that this book is for folks that want 
want to begin to help and want to begin to understand this world differently than what they've been fed by like colonial means of education and living and culture. I think that this book helps to like solidify that the alternative has always been here and that alternatives can continue to be here and continue to grow. And I'd really like to, you know, I'd really like to see like, like all like the reses, like, um, so I, a little background on me, like I, I was res raised my whole life. Um, my in San Carlos in Arizona and Fort Belknap in Montana. And like the solutions that like we, the, the economic impacts we see by the economic impacts of like colonization and genocide and capitalism, I think like the res is one of the places where you you see it like compounded and ultra like dish. And I think I'd really like, you know, like for my people back home to get a hold of this book and to discuss it and like for us to really begin to say, wait a minute, like we already practiced this on really small levels with our different families and our extended families. And why is it that like, we're so like anti-communist now? Why is it that we're so anti-socialist now? Why is it that like, we're so anti this and that versus like the stuff we celebrate and the stuff we struggle with, like it's directly related to like a disconnect that happened between like, what folks would deem communism now and versus what communism is. And like, it's just like, to me, I think this book is a good, a good spot to show people like, you know, you like, this is like something that need that like people need to see and read, especially for folks back home, because I think that we're getting tired. No, I'm going to rephrase that. We have been tired of like, you know, the niceties, the politeness. We have been tired of like, you know, these stories that the government feeds us about our own people, about our own ways of living, about our own, like our own rights to exist. And I think that this book, The Red Deal, it offers like not only like history and like political context, but it offers like these solid concrete like moments where you're just like, oh, you know what? We can do this. Like, you know, we don't have to think about this anymore in this way. And the Red Deal is one of those things that I think is like just a good pushing point. I think that's where I'm going to end with that. Thank you. That's great, Orion. Um... I think this book is for everyone and it's really a mandate. Uh, it's not a roadmap. It's not a toolkit. It's not a manifesto. It's a mandate. This is what we have to do. And through all that the Red Nation has done um, over the last years, um, six, seven, seven years, um, nothing was more challenging than 2020 in so many ways for uh, our people and for ourselves within within the Red Nation, our comrades. And so I think this book was written um, really out of love. And it's it was written with, as, as uh, Melanie said, you know, 20 or so people getting together and and starting the actual process of writing and then going out into the community and adding the voices of hundreds more. So it was written with love and it's written about love and it's 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 the love that we we have for our comrades within the Red Nation but that's just a shadow of the love we feel for our communities and our people and our land and the, the, the relatives, um, the four-legged relatives and the, the, um, the winged relatives. And uh, it was written for them too. So what do I want them to do? What do I want people to do with it? look at it and realize what our world looked like before capitalism, what it looked like before imperialism and how we treated one another, how we treated the earth. And 
build that love back and that desire to return to that world because too many of, of our own people are desperately hanging on to these colonial constructs within our governments and within um, our, our communities. And they're on that path to extinction by embracing those, those structures. And we need to gently move them um, to the left and keep going to the left, 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 because they've been blinded and fooled into believing that capitalism is going to give them what they want and that somehow going to bring them their heart's desires. And if you just work hard enough and, you know, do that 80 hour week that somehow, you know, you can be the next Bill Gates. And we all know that's not true. We don't, we, we want to stop wanting that. We want to um, live in dignity. We want to live in a world that's not on fire. We want to live in a world where the, the, the soil is free of contaminants so we can grow corn. We want to live in, in a world where the water is clean enough to drink and where the air is not polluted. And those things can only be achieved through decolonization. Um, through the abolishment of capitalism and imperialism. We want to be able to, to move freely with our relatives in the global South and to join hands and recognize that we have a connection with, with them that goes back millennia and that has been denied to us by this colonial project. Um, so this book's for everyone. This book should be read by everyone. And what do I want people to do? I, I want them to start walking the red road again. Thanks for that, everyone. You know, it makes me, um, it makes me think, uh, I think D, Demetrius, sorry, we call him D, <laughs> Red Nation. Uh, I think you were talking about how there were like these trends kind of existing um, around the time that we decided to write the Red Deal. Um, a trend I saw that became really prominent with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in the spring of 2020 was this incredibly like nihilistic view on the future. It was an anti-future perspective um, coming out of, I, I would say again, not just capitalists, you know, the ruling class is obviously anti-future. I mean, like the, the speculative and kind of disaster capitalism that we've seen under neoliberalism over the last 20 years is very much about like a here and now, you know, boom and bust, like how much can I make in the immediate kind of thing, but that there are elements of that in the movement and like more militant parts of the environmental justice movement as well, because um, something we saw happening was a type of eco-fascism out of the left um, where it's like, well, the world is on fire. Uh, just let everyone die. Let like the majority of the population die. And then like, it's just mother earth healing herself. Right. And so it, you know, it's okay. <laughs> this is happening. And we were like, hell no, that is anti-human. That is an anti-indigenous perspective. I even saw indigenous people, some indigenous leftists um, making these arguments. And, you know, for us, like I was taught, we were all taught in the red nation by elders, by communists, by revolutionaries, by indigenous grandmas, right? We have all been taught that the future is something that we embrace. That is who we are as indigenous people. We are a future oriented people. We believe in our bones that, that our people will be here seven generations from now speaking their languages and having relationships with the land that we were meant to have you know, that were given to us when we were created as human beings, as five-fingered beings. And so there is a built-in optimism that isn't based on liberal bullshit, right? It's not like, it's not like we're like, oh, we're like we're just optimistic because like this is like this positivity that we're supposed to traffic in, you know, in this kind of like discourse um, that occurs like in the media and on social media but that our optimism, it, it's, you know, it's built into who we are as a future oriented people. 
and our movements are always future oriented. And so this idea, right, that somehow climate change cannot be stopped or that like, you know, it's just a geontological or a geolog geological kind of formation. So it's just like, oh, we're just gonna have to deal with the consequences of this on a mass level. Um, that's just unacceptable <laughs> to us as indigenous people, because again, we believe, you know, we believe, we believe in what we were told when we were first created, that this is our path, the red road that Elena was just talking about. Um, and that you have to have revolutionary optimism. We, you know, what is that saying? A pessimism of the intellect and an optimism of the will. Like we very, I think we, we try even under very difficult circumstances to embrace that in the Red Nation. And the Red Deal for all of its honesty in your face kind of reality check is also a deeply optimistic, I think, vision of change. And we truly believe in the power of ourselves and our people to make that change. And so for me to answer that question, I, you know, I think it is also for everyone you know, the way that you all answered that question. And that what I want people to do is to like question very critically the assumptions that we make in the movement and the alternative, the so-called alternatives that are on offer like green capitalism and really think like, are, will this allow us to be here in the future? And if the answer to that is no, then you need to be doing something else, period, right? And you probably should be joining a movement <laughs> and helping to build a movement, which is probably the only solution. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna turn, uh, we have about 20 minutes left. Um, so I'm gonna turn to some audience questions if that's okay. I think we have some good ones. Uh, so I'm gonna ask a question. Uh, the first question is, how do you change the minds of folks who think that the Green New Deal plan of just inducing investment in new technology and the government funding is the solution, right? So this is a question, I mean, I would summarize it as like green capitalism is the solution. What would you tell those people? <laughs> or what does the Red Deal say about that? <laughs> you kind of answered this already, D, before your family emergency. Yeah, and I can actually expand because I, I just remember some things I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> my response to that is like, OK, so um, like I guess what like what Elon Musk tried to do um, with Tesla and like, you know, pushing this whole like fleet of, I don't know, electric vehicles and saying like, you know what, we're making the transition from like gasoline powered vehicles to like electric vehicles but also like we're going to install all these solar panels and everything's going to be green and like reducing emissions and like we're, we're saving the world by preventing climate change it's like okay okay big dog um well the problem with that is you're still using like the same method of just like resource extraction except you're doing it like on a different material and not only that you're still killing like indigenous people in, within that process and like we, we saw it like it was like blatantly obvious like when 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 Bolivia was getting attacked, um, there was like a whole ass coup that was happening, and it like it it was it was it was it was in the news. People were shouting about it, and now like it, it failed thankfully. But these are just like the things that when you say like okay like like let's back like the 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 stuff that the the green the green economy that the U.S. is pushing. Okay, but you're also like killing indigenous people. You're overthrowing their government. They're electric. They're democratically elected governments, but also um, this also ties into like um, MMIW, a huge movement that are a huge uh, a problem that's happening here on Turtle Island um, that comes from resource extraction. Man camps are established near native communities where they're extracting these materials. And as a result, like our women, our, our children, even our men are, are, are missing from from colonizers, from people that settle near our lands. Um, so like, it's not like these issues are like, like, like separated, they're in silos. Um, these, these issues are connected. And when that happens, um, you know, the, the people that hold the knowledges of how to, how to protect our environment, they're killed along the way. Um, so when you say like, okay, let, let's, 
let 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 let's keep let's keep fueling the machine. Let's keep let's keep giving the U.S. like all these resources and all this power. What you're essentially doing is just saying like, you know what, fuck, fuck indigenous people. Like we're not even gonna listen to them. But also like we're still gonna we're still we're still we're still on this trajectory down. All we're saying is like listen to indigenous people and let us lead the way. Um, don't let the U. Don't let the U.S. like lead any more stuff. It's literally killing us. Um, but that's all I got to say. Also, enough to to, <laughs> to come off of what Dee said. So, so it, yeah, exactly. Um, Elon Musk and and the lithium mining in Bolivia um, to to um, propel his electric cars is is literally the same extractive um, uh, industry that that it happens with fossil fuels. The the what we have to look at is the material conditions, the the conditions on the ground, and it just is painfully obvious when you look at this so-called United States that the capital is held in the hands of so few and the rest of us are suffering. So why is Bill Gates buying up all the farmland in these United States? Why should he even have the capital to do that? Why should we as a people, indigenous people, but all people of color, all poor people, all uh, people who are struggling, all the humble people of the earth, why should we do without while the capital is held in the hands of so few who are doing so little for so many? And why should we not have access to healthcare, to housing, to healthy food, to education, um, to safe places for women and children and elders while Bill Gates owns 90% of the farmland. Um, these, this is why capitalism needs to be overturned. This is why the Green New Deal with green capitalism will not work. It, it needs to, it, it doesn't, it's hard to even say it doesn't go far enough because it doesn't even begin to even start the journey, much less go. Heck yeah, Dee, Elena. <laughs> Listen, Dee said this already, but I'm just going to throw down. I'm just going to tell you straight up. Like, I don't know what more we have to do to convince all you all people that like capitalism is trash and it's killing our planet, it's killing our future and that indigenous people are like face like the some of the greatest burdens because of that, the greatest violence because of it. Like the transition to green energy, you're just gonna keep extracting different resources for so-called clean energy, but we're still gonna be the resource colonies that's gonna dig the goddamn world. <laughs> right out of its recessions and out of its like you know climate disasters and we're just going to continue to have to deal with the consequences of that in our communities even though this is our goddamn land right and it's been stolen orion comes from like our relatives our and relatives san carlos apache right who have been fighting for six years to protect a place called oak flat from a multinational copper mining corporation copper what do you think copper is? Copper is considered a clean energy resource. Copper is used for solar panels, right? The solar panel fad that's happening across America and across the world. But it's, it's Orion's community, it's his nation or their nation, right? That is going to face and have to deal the, with the consequences of that extraction. So dirty energy, clean energy, the settler economy is still the same. Native nations, Native nations are still the resource colony 
from which the value that the rest of the world gets to accumulate is extracted from. We are the primitive, we are the primitive accumulation moment in the chain of capitalist production through resource extraction. And we will continue to be so whether or not this is a green economy or I don't know, like a dirty ass, like an oil and gas economy. We already know because we know how energy development works in this society. And there was another question earlier about the relationship, right, between racism, colonialism, and capitalism. This right here, I think, shows you what that relationship is. Capitalism, right, and the investment in oil and in energy infrastructure, whether it's dirty or clean energy, right, that that infrastructure mines indigenous land and life to extract value for the accumulation of wealth elsewhere, it never goes back to indigenous people. We just die. We just die. We're always on these like spectrums of death because of this production chain. So this is what capitalists do. But that form of capitalist development functions as a type of colonialism, right? Because it makes it so that we cannot live in our what small homelands we still have left on reservations after the goddamn United States just stole and liquidated everything and violated all of the treaties, right? And so then we just get forcibly removed or we die off and then that land goes into the hands of private property owners or the state you know, uh, like federal or public land or corporations buy it to do more mining. And so in this way, resource extraction as a form, of, as a capitalist enterprise functions so seamlessly as a type of settler colonialism to eliminate us, to kill us and to remove us from our lands. So those lands can go into the hands of settler property owners at whatever level that that exists. And the reason why that's racist, I, I hope that's pretty clear. <laughs> That's incredibly racist. The function of anti-Indian racism, right? This is something that a Dakota scholar, one of the founders of Native American studies said, called it anti-Indian racism. There's very little conversation nationally about this type of racism, but that racism functions as a, as, as a mechanism of settler colonialism. So you kill off native people through all of these different types of capitalist or colonial projects, heteropatriarchy completely divesting native women of our customary power and traditional modes of governance, for example, or just like just making us more susceptible to dying, which is why MMIW is a thing that we now have to think about and contend with, right? And so there's all these different types of of elimination, the project of settler colonialism is about elimination and that racism functions, right? To reinforce the idea that native people should not be here anymore, that we should be disappeared, that if we are here, we should be killed or we should be removed, right? And so that this is how colonialism, capitalism and racism relate to each other, at least when it comes to indigenous people, right? Those things function differently with other populations, but we're talking about our, our people and you know our histories. Um, so I just went off for a moment, but that's kind of my answer to that question. Um, I'm going to pivot a bit. So that's us. So we have about ten minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask one more. What do y'all want to answer? You want to answer a question related to the Red Deal, or do you want to answer a question related to the Red Nation? <laughs> Uh, should we focus on the Red Deal for now? Even though that question is at the YouTube one, like um, how do you see the movement moving across continents? Yeah, that was actually the question I was gonna ask. So um, yeah. let's do that one then. Okay, so how sorry. Does... No, it's okay, <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, no one's in charge here. Uh, so how does the Red Nation visualize indigenous organizing of the Red Deal? on a continental movements level, given the emergency, as well as the violent repression of settler states south of Turtle Island. So maybe like the second half of the question is a bit complicated. The first one I think is like the, the meat of the question. How do we visualize indigenous organizing of the Red Deal on a continental movement level? So not just, North America, I'm assuming the Americas, I think is what this question. Actually, I have an idea for this. I thought, well, so um, I've thought about like this for a minute in the Southwest, but there's so many communities here that we rely on like um, 
We rely on agriculture, and I've always wondered what it would be like to just start forming coalitions with like all these native farmers from the Southwest. And I think that using food and like agriculture would be one of the ways that like you could use this to organize on, honestly, because like the more like you get in contact with the people that are actually working the land, that are actually being exploited for the land, I think like the better chances you have of like them being like, oh shit, this is a good book. And so that that's where I would think is like not to be corny or cheesy, but using food, honestly. Like I know that there's like really urgent matters, but like if the people aren't eating, we're not fighting. If the people aren't eating, we're not like, we're not building movements. If the people aren't eating, we're not people. And so I think it would be a cool thing to try to like use like farmers and not just like indigenous farmers, but like, and not, not like the big ones. I'm just thinking that like, it could happen that way. One day it's gonna happen. You're gonna see it, I know it, but I don't know. I think that using like that type of like workers, something so like, if we're not eating, we're not people. Like, I think that like, that would be a good way to like start like organizing and holding like teach-ins or just like explaining like what like the philosophies of this book are. Not even philosophies. I don't want to phrase it like that. But that's my little tidbit on that. I love that, Orion. Um, and we already have so historical and um, ancestral relationships with people in the global south. Um, I I love our relatives in the south. I actually think we have so much to learn from them, so much more to learn from them about how to organize and um, struggle and um, enact change so it's hard to conceive with in the middle of a global pandemic of being able to move freely between the north um and um and the indigenous communities to the south but someday we'll be able to do that more freely and i know that red nation members have already gone to places like venezuela and um, Bolivia, and um, I'm not sure where where else. Ecuador. Yeah, Ecuador. So we we need to have communication. We need to have discourse. We need to engage. We need to listen to how they have been successful uh, at. Um, I mean, I, Bolivia, and and Dee brought this up too. I, I mean, I love. I just have in my in my mind's eye, the um, indigenous women in Bolivia on the streets walking for days and days to the capital to demand that um, Evo Morales be, be brought back. Of course, he was, he was exiled. He came back, but not as the leader of Bolivia, but they brought the country to a halt they literally stopped the country because they blocked all the all the roads and um we need to learn from them how to do that we need to learn how to um come together and shed all this liberalism and neoliberalism and um identity politics and every all of those other scourges that go along with it and we just need to focus on what is going to free our people like what is going to liberate our people like they're doing it and we're talking about it so that's what we need to learn from them i don't think they have anything to learn from us except that we have huge hearts we have huge hearts and we're and we're super ready to get out there and do it like we're eager. It's kind of funny. Um, just reminds me of like, like football. It's like, you're not the most talented or like the fastest or strongest kid out there on the field, Bella, as long as you got a, if, as long as you got a heart, you'll, you'll, you'll find a place to play. But no, like I, I totally agree with, with, with what both my comrades said. Um, I don't think there's like a whole lot that, I mean, relationship building, um, we're getting there as the, the Red Nation. However, like, 
we're like in a really unique position here, like within the, like as indigenous peoples, like within the belly of the beast of like US empire um, to really like start that movement from the inside. There's so much indigenous people globally that are actually like relying on us, like to be good relatives and help them in those ways. Um, not just in the global South, but also like in Palestine too. Um, when I went like they, like in, in Palestine, like the biggest thing that a lot of these, um, especially like older, like Palestinian, like elders, like told me like, is to really just like get after like your local governments, really get after like um, your elected officials or just trying to create policy change. So like, they're not literally like getting bombed or like exiled from their own lands or like our, our, like the US is like funding Israel to literally just like genocide them. Um, we're like in a really unique position as indigenous people here to get that movement started. I don't think it's so much that we need to like tell other like indigenous people like globally about what to do because they're already living it. And we're also living it too, but we're in a unique position um, to actually do something about it. It's just like, we're not like our, like our people are like not there at the same level that other indigenous people are globally. So I think getting the movement started here in 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 the so-called United States, that's where it's all going to start. And the Red Deal is just um, the game plan about how to get this started. It's like, okay, it's written. We got we 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 got the we got the cheat codes. Let's just put it in. Um, but yep, that's it. Oh, you just had to bring in a sports metaphor, didn't you, D? Oh my God, this is all the time. Um, no, I, so there were some other remaining questions. We don't have much time left. We just have a few minutes about um, kind of connecting, like why, why movements here in the United States have seemed to shift their focus to something more domestic, right? Like militarized policing, which is an important issue, but like thinking about that within the larger scope of anti-imperialist work, right? The imperial, the U.S. imperial war machine as related right to the militarization of police for example and police violence in the united states and i think this relates to questions of internationalism and working at a, a, a hemispheric level right for example like the question of scale instead of just something small like our tribal communities working at the, the level of question of scale and that you know elena described a little bit of this already but the red nation is deeply invested in left internationalist work. We understand. So one of the traditions, the left traditions that we draw from is actually the third world decolonization movement, right? And something that those movements, as well as Palestine, um, you know, because the liberation of Palestine has really always been at the center of the Red Nation's politics and thinking on settler colonialism, decolonization, um, like the kind of traditions of liberation, these struggles that we draw from and study and really think about how we can implement them, you know, in a contemporary moment in, in the configuration of the Red Nation to, to respond to the material conditions as they exist now versus at another time and place, which was another question that we were not gonna be able to get to. But that Palestine taught me, for example, um, I went to Palestine a decade ago um, and it really facilitated my politicization and radicalization. Palestine taught me that we will never achieve self-determination as indigenous nations without international solidarity, period. And I think that this is something that third world decolonization movements, particularly those that were revolutionary, taught have, have taught us, right? And so the indigenous movement in the United States in the so-called belly of the beast, right? We don't, it's very rare actually to hear indigenous radicals talk about US imperialism, to think about our struggle for decolonization in the same frame as those struggles for decolonization and national liberation, right? That happened in, in, the, in Africa, that happened in Asia, that happened in Latin America. And so we very much see our struggle for liberation, national liberation, self-determination determination, and decolonization as related to those long histories that still very much inform the revolutionary formations, however successful, that exist in places like Palestine or that currently exist in places in the global south, you know, Latin America, for example. And so we know, as my comrades have said, 
that we have a great deal to learn because those countries have actually a had real revolutions first of all no revolution here to speak of <laughs> that we've organized <laughs> so we send comrades to other places right so that we can get training and understand how we might be able to implement that here to build those relationships because those places have had actual revolutions they're fighting us imperialism constantly most of them are under us sanctions the imperial war machine right and so we are trying very hard to educate our own people using this global internationalist perspective that our struggle here too is against US imperialism. It's not just against colonialism. We are the oldest anti-imperialist struggle in this on this continent. It's indigenous nations. We're not just people. We're not just individuals. We're nations. We were nations that were overthrown illegally by the United States that then stole our land and have denied us our self-determination and our liberation for hundreds of years. Our struggle is against US empire the same way that those struggles of our relatives in the global south, the nations, the Bolivias, the Venezuelas, right, of the global south, that their struggle too is against US imperialism. And so when we think about you know, an abolitionist perspective on, on carcerality, we're always thinking about it from an anti-imperialist perspective as well. And so for us thinking about like, you know, facing off with the fash and with the police here is just the same for us as facing off with the US military and the various apparatuses of US imperialism, you know, that we have been facing off against for hundreds of years. So I hope that we're at time, um, it's 5.32, well, 5.32 mountain time. I hope that helped to answer um, some of your questions. I know we didn't get to, unless you guys want to answer a big question <laughs> about the Red Nation to close it out. It's all about like, uh, oh my God, how are we different than AIM and like what's different now and like how we related to Standing Rock. It's like all the things about the last 50 years of indigenous struggle <laughs> in the United States. And what is, where does the Red Nation fit in that history? Do you want to like, you want to tackle that or no? <laughs> <laughs> Next time, man. Okay, that's fine with me. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Hey, thank you, Melanie and Elena and Orion and, and Demetrius. And uh, uh, I, I did want to mention uh, a couple of events which kind of sort of flow naturally from uh, the topics we've discussed here today. There's a, uh, a panel on September, Saturday, May 29th at 10 a.m. called Neither Settler Nor Native, which is uh, based on a good new book by Mam Mahmoud Mandani and has uh, Roxanne Dunbar Artiz, Mahmoud Mandani, Samira Esmer, and, and Ted Swedenberg. And it's more or less about the Palestinian and uh, and parallels in terms of, of various settler colonialisms around the world, which of course uh, you know very well and, and have been keeping up the solidarity on that front for a long time. And, and uh, there, uh, Nick Estes is also on a panel on the 16th on uh, revolutionary and counter-revolutionary internationalism. I think Nick is gonna talk about the the links between uh, indigenous movements here and in Bolivia, which of course are, are, are uh, for all the reasons having to do with uh, the US supported coup are mm -hmm. kind of vital in the new. And, and maybe he will talk about fourth world links, which have been going on for a long time through the United Nations. It's only news to white America, I guess. But uh, so, so I think when the internationalism dropped uh, from the 60s and 70s, uh, from our side of the left, it, at least this was going on steadily from the Red Nation, and I salute you for that, comrades. Keep it up and lead the way for us. Be a beacon of light. Uh, the, true, the true inheritors of the 60s, anyway, or at least the anticipators of the 60s when everybody went back to the land, you know, and all the rest of the counterculture went off and started working for uh, Amazon and uh, tech companies. So uh, from counterculture to cyberculture, except in the Red Nation, you know, the original counterculture. 
So uh, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, you're always welcome at Wed May and uh, enjoy the rest of a sunny day in Albuquerque and we'll try to do the same in Seattle. Thank you very much. Thank oh, you. and the last thing I wanna say, I do have to keep pitching for money. Uh, please go to our website and donate, donate. We have no institutional funding, so we depend on your generosity. We want to keep bringing you this insane extravaganza of 43 events in a month every May uh, for, for crazy people on the left. So uh, thank you very much. And we'll see you tomorrow for two more events. Well, I should now, I'm sorry I said I'd end, but I better promote tomorrow's events too, because I did a very bad job of doing that before we start. So, so just as you know, what's coming up for the, uh, in the near future, Tomorrow at 10 a.m., we have workers' autonomy from Detroit to Turin and beyond uh, with Paul Buell, Nico Pizzolato, Andrew Anastasi, Kevin Van Meter, and Scott Kurashigi about another form of internationalism, uh, the links between the work of James Boggs and Italian autonomia. Uh, on Tuesday at May 11th at 11 a.m., we have the Angry Workers Collective coming from England who are gonna talk about class power on zero hours, strategies for the current moment, that's anti-work stuff. And to continue in the anti-work vein, on Wednesday, May 12th at 11 a.m., Post-Work Horizons with Kathy Weeks, Will Strong of Autonomy, Julian Saravo and Kate Aronoff. So lots of stuff coming up. Uh, check out www.redmayseattle.org. Hope to see you at any of these and have a nice day.